Shabbat Shalom. Before I went to rabbinical school, I worked as a, an assistant preschool teacher, which is a great job um, if you want to learn how to potty train 10 two-year-olds at once. Uh, but you do learn a lot of skills, actually, and I think a lot of them are skills you don't learn in regards to toddlers until you actually have a toddler of your own. A lot of you who have either raised children or have recently been a child, this will sound familiar. Now, let's say you have a toddler, you have a kid, little kid, and you just need them to just drink some water. They've been playing all day, it's hot, you just need them to drink some water. Would you say, do you want to drink water now? No, no, because what are they going to say to you? No, because as soon as they learn the word no, it's the only word they use, and it's just no. And you don't say, well, what do you want to drink? Because then the answer is going to be juice, or you no, know, chocolate milk, no, it's just liquid sugar, can't, just, you just need them to drink some darn water. So what I learned while working in preschool with all these two and a half, three and a half year olds, is to say, do you want to drink out of the red cup or the blue cup? Brilliant. Because then their answer can really only be, I want the red cup. Okay, well, here you go. I want the blue cup. Blue cup coming right up. There you go. It works almost every time because it gives the kid this kind of idea that they have a choice. Now, they don't really have a choice, you know, because I've already decided that they need to drink water and they're drinking water, but they get the illusion of a choice. And you could say, oh, well, Sarah, that's very mean. You're tricking these little kids. But if you've had kids, you know that sometimes you just need them to make the right choice, need them to drink the water. So you give them the illusion of a choice. But it's really actually more than the illusion of a choice. You're giving them the idea that they actually have control of the situation. They don't. You're the parent. You're controlling the situation. They're going to drink that water. But you're giving them the illusion of control. For a good purpose, but the illusion of control. And this isn't something before you say, oh, well, that's something only little kids could fall for. I'm an adult. I could never fall in the illusion of control. Untrue. Multiple studies have shown something that we know is true, that we think we have control, way more control, over our surroundings, over the outcomes of our choices, over our environment. We think we have way more control than we actually do. We, too, suffer from the illusion of control. We spend, actually, a lot of time thinking that we are in control of every aspect of our lives, of all the parts of our environment around us, of the, even the people around us. But we don't. And just in case you say, oh, well, Rabbi, I mean, like, maybe that's other people, but I actually do. No, that's not. There's a very famous experiment. It's been repeated multiple times and has to do with lottery tickets. They gave people lottery tickets. Now, half the people got just random tickets, random numbers. Half the people got to choose their numbers. And they were told you can trade anytime. You can trade with somebody else. People who picked their own numbers were far more reluctant to trade their tickets. Well, we all know lotteries are random. So you don't have any better or worse chance of winning with the numbers you picked than with random numbers. But people felt like, well, I chose these numbers. So they're, they're going to be a little bit better. I have some element of control over this thing that is actually completely random. But I can do you one better. As they choose numbers, some numbers, you know, like, there are better odds and worse odds. So they would tell the people in this experiment, well, these numbers have better odds, these numbers have worse odds, so if you want to trade and get a card, you know, a ticket with better odds, you can trade. But even knowing that they held a ticket with worse odds, people were still reluctant to give it up if they chose those numbers because, gosh darn it, I chose those numbers. I chose it. I chose the blue cup. Okay. We don't like feeling like we're out of control. We don't like that feeling that we're out of control of the choices that we make that maybe they don't have as much of an effect like we'd like them to, that 
the world around us isn't as much in our control as we would like it to be. Think of how much time you really spend trying to control or wishing you could control the thoughts and actions of people around you. And I don't mean it in a mean way or a manipulative way even. It can be for a good reason. Like, if you have kids, think about how much time you spend going, oh, I just, just do what I say. <laughs> just do what I'm asking you to do. I know what would make your life better or easier. I know what the right choice is. Just do what I, your spouse, your partner. You know, maybe you don't say it out loud, but you're thinking it, you're like, oh, just, just load the dishwasher. I know the right way. I know the right way to sweep the floor. That guy. And it would just be better. It would better be better for you. Like, this house would be cleaner if you just do it. Just do it my way. Just do it my way. I know it's better. And we think that because we think it actually has a... Your parents, I don't care how old your parents are, no matter how old they get, you think, you know, it's like, ugh, dad, just like, use this kind of phone, make this kind of choice. Mom, like, don't, why are you driving? Like, I don't, I, and I'm just trying to make your life better. Just do it the way I, you're just trying, you're trying to control. You're trying to control something, somebody, that you can't actually control. And it's all because we think we actually can control these things and people in the first place. And it frustrates us. Back in LA, uh, I worked when I was in rabbinical school as a chaplain, a hospital chaplain. And we spent you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours on our floors working with patients. And a couple hours a week we would spend together as cohort, all of our kind of a newer chaplains with a kind of supervisor who'd been doing it for just years, decades, I think. And we would bring case studies. You know, a patient we'd recently seen, something we had been doing, so we could kind of tackle it together and unpack it. One of the chaplains brought a case, a patient she'd been working with. And I remember her saying, this guy, I, he's so miserable and he's so unhappy. And, and I just, I told him, all you, you have to do this, you have to change this way that you're thinking and this way that you're approaching it. And if you do that, you'll be so much happier and it'll be so much better for you. And she was getting really frustrated really frustrated, and our supervisor, who'd been doing this for a very, very long time, said, but, but you can't make somebody else change, though. You can't actually change them, and you can't make them change. They have to do it on their own. I know, I know, I know, but, but if they only did it the way I was telling them, then their life would be so much better, it'd be so much easier, they wouldn't be so unhappy. But you can't control other people, she said to her. You can't actually... You can help, you can guide, but you can't actually control. And this other chaplain, she was miserable. She was miserable because she thought she could control the situation in this person. She thought she could change them, and she was unhappy because she couldn't. We all become unhappy when we can't actually change or control the world around us, the circumstances around us, the people around us. Even for a good cause, even for a good cause. Okay, Rabbi, you'll say, well, that's very nice, fine. We all suffer from the illusion of control, and it's harmful to us, so what do I do about it? Fair question for our Rabbi. How do I disrupt this illusion of control that makes, makes me think that I'm bigger, you know, than I am, that I'm more powerful, that I'm more important, that I can exert more effective influence on the world around me, on lives around me than I actually can. Fine. How do I disrupt that illusion I suffer from? There is a guy, and most conservative rabbis, I would say, generally, do not quote this guy very often. I think because he spent a lot of his life railing against reform and conservative Judaism. He was wrong on that, obviously, I think. But on this one particular subject, I think he was right. He talks about the illusion of control. And he says that the solution to disrupting this illusion of control is found in Parshat Vayakel. The Parsha, this week, as 
in so many prior weeks is full of very tedious explanations and pretty repetitive. And how do you build a tabernacle? And how many gold rings do you attach to this thing? And what kinds of, right, how many things are you bringing? And what kind of fabric? And what kind I've been talking about this for weeks. The other rabbis have been talking about this for weeks. Our intrepid B'nai Mitzvah have been waxing poetic about this for weeks. And this guy, Rabbi, Rabbi Raphael Samson Hirsch, says, forget all that stuff. It's not, the, it's not where the solution lies. But this Parsha has one line. One line with the solution. And it's none of that stuff. The line is, six days... Your work may be done, but on the seventh day, you will have a Sabbath of complete rest. For six days, you do your work, and on the seventh day, no work. That's the solution, he says. Now, you have to know what the word work actually is here, because it's not... Anyone speak Hebrew? Anyone know a little bit of Hebrew? A little bit of Hebrew. I know you do, and you, pointing at the rabbis. What's the word in, in Hebrew for work? Just work, stum. Avodah. Yeah, you all knew it. You're tricking me up here. Avodah, right? Avodah means work. That's not the word in this line, in Vayakel. It's melacha. Melacha does not mean just work. We think it means work. We talk about, oh, it means don't work on Shabbat. That's not what it means. Melacha is a creative endeavor, a skilled, very intentional endeavor, a permanent endeavor. You do something, you mean to do it, it requires a little bit of intentionality. That's what you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. And the rabbis broke it down into lots of categories. You can't sew two things together, you can't write, you can't cook, you can't light a fire, da da da. That's what you're not allowed to do. And Raphael Samson Hirsch says, that is it. And that's not even the whole point. It's not that the whole point of Shabbat is you're not allowed to write or cook or, or stitch two things together. In and of itself, that's not actually the point of the rule against doing malacha. Not writing or stitching or cooking isn't the point of not working on Shabbat. He says, and he says it the best, and keep in mind, it's 18th century, so keep that in mind. He says, to cease for a whole day from all business, from all work, the frenzied hurry-scurry of our time, to close all the exchanges, all the workshops, the factories, to stop all the railway services. Great heavens, he says, how would it be possible the pulse of life would stop beating, and the world would perish. But would the world perish, he asks? On the contrary, it would be saved. When we stop doing work, melacha, these creative, permanent, skilled, intentional endeavors, we stop trying to do all these things, this work, we stop trying to control the world around us people around us. We get a reprieve from having to have mastery over everything, over everyone, all the time. We get a break when we stop trying to change everything all the time. Shabbat gives us a reprieve, and it's not permanent. We don't have Shabbat seven days a week. We don't six days a week. You do your work. Because we're people, and that's what we do. We work, we, we try to change things, we try to make things better, and gosh darn it, it's just human nature to try to control the world. But we need one day, just one day, where we get to get a break from that. And you get to breathe, and you stop trying to control everything all the time. And as it turns out, that one day, the world does not stop spinning when we stop working. Our lives go on even when we stop trying to control every aspect of them. Funnily enough, they keep going. So Shabbat serves as a reminder to us that the burden doesn't fully rest on our shoulders, that it's okay to take a break from trying to do everything, control everything all the time. Shabbat this temporary break 
from all of our work gives us freedom from the illusion of control. Don't you deserve a little bit of that freedom? Shabbat shalom. <laughs>